an ace in just one day. On the 19th, we had 12 planes on deck, wings spread, and uh, when the radars start noticing big groups of planes coming in, then uh, they launch us. We climbed off, and I spotted uh, three specks coming in our direction, but the sound of the fighter director's voice was a little more serious than just three, the way I figured. And I kept looking, and sure enough, there was a, a whole mob, of, a rambling mass of planes coming in our direction, about 2,000 feet below. He had put us in the perfect position, 2,000 feet above them, uh, off to the side just a little bit. And so we, we got over to them, and then we just started to peel, uh, peel on down. It was just narrowing down to uh, go after my first plane on the edge. Got him burning pretty fast and pull back up again and then started down again. And it's just a matter of going back and forth. And on my second run, I got on one of them, burned him, dipped my wing over and slid over to another plane alongside of him and burned him down too. I always remember, I think I had a little lapse in feeling there because all of a sudden I could see that tail gunner on that Judy, that aircraft, as the plane was going down in a deep spiral. Uh, uh, he was still peppering away at me with his 7.7 .7 on the thing and for just a split second I kind of felt sorry for him. The story of the shift of power at sea from the once mighty dreadnoughts to aircraft carriers had a final chapter. Yamato, the world's biggest battleship and pride of the Japanese fleet, was sent to her watery grave on the afternoon of April 7, 1945, bludgeoned by the aircraft from two American carriers. Four months later, the war was over. When World War II ends, the great new facts of life are jet aircraft and the bomb. And the question is, carriers that are very effective with much slower airplanes that carry relatively small bombs, can they still be effective in future? And there's a lot of interest in what it will take to make a carrier effective with these new things. From the aircraft carrier Illustrious at exercise in the Atlantic come first pictures of the Navy's own jet fighter, the Vickers Supermarine Attacker, a descendant of the Spitfire. The British Navy became instrumental in solving the handling problems of the fast, heavy jets. British aircraft carriers have always tended to be a little bit on the small side in comparison with the aircraft operating from them. This was particularly true after the Second World War, when we couldn't afford to build new aircraft carriers, but aircraft were getting larger and much faster, uh, in particular with the advent of jets. Therefore, the British take the lead in the development of carrier operational equipment. Using dummy bundles at first, HMS Perseus tests the Navy's new steam-operated catapult. With the new system, planes can be launched from a stationary ship. Here goes a radio-controlled pilotless plane. Sunk below deck, the catapult doesn't interfere with ordinary flying on and off. Now with pilot in control, the catapult will cope with large planes too. Results are so good that we're now going to teach the Americans how to do it. It proves once again that the old firm can still think up new wrinkles. The catapults of the past are hydraulic. They operate with a hydraulic ram and a lot of pulleys. It turns out that the power you can get that way is limited. The ropes break, the wire ropes. But if you have steam, you just have a piston and it goes wham. You can get enormous power. Now, that power is equivalent to giving the airplane a very long runway to take off. So instead of airplanes that weigh, say, 20,000 pounds, we talk about 60, 70,000 pound airplanes. Suddenly, there's a new world. Man's out, thumbs up, don't take a new world that uses the power source of the Industrial Revolution. Steam continues to power the catapults on board the Nimitz class carriers. Here we go. The physical difference of the two catapults was 
A hydraulic catapult, you get the full wham right at first, and then it diminishes as you go down the deck. The steam catapult, uh, you pick it up all it going down the deck. It has various orifices that keep putting more and more steam to you as you go down the deck. But landing the fast jets onto carriers was a hazardous operation. The faster approach gave the pilots less time to respond to the landing signals officer. Some days, even the wire barrier failed to prevent crashes. In the late 40s and early 50s, the, the casualty rate amongst fleet air arm aircrew was terrible. I, I joined the Glory in Malta. She'd been out there just two years. She'd arrived with 38 aircrew, and they were holding the 38th funeral the day I joined, after two years. Um, something had to be done about it. Um, a lot of the accidents were on landing, and a brilliant Royal Navy engineer called Nick Goodhart devised a scheme so that it was all done by mirrors. I was working in the Ministry of Aviation, in fact, uh, for a um, captain called um, Dennis Campbell. I, I went to him and said, uh, I, I'm going to set up a little demonstration. And so we got his um, secretary and uh, asked her if she had a mirror in her handbag. And of course, she had the inevitable nice little rectangular mirror in her handbag. And if she had any lipstick, of course she did. So we said, right, put the mirror on the deck of the model carrier and draw a lipstick line across the middle of it. And then we got a uh, torch, a flashlight in, in American, and uh, put it on the stern of the carrier pointing towards the mirror. And we said to Miss Montgomery, the secretary, go back to the far side of the room and move your head up and down until you see the reflection of the flashlight in the middle of the mirror. When you've got it in the middle of the mirror, walk forward slowly, keeping the reflection on the lipstick line, which she duly did. And she walked across the room, getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And um, eventually, her chin came to rest on the uh, round down of the model. So he was duly impressed as uh, Captain Campbell. He thought, really, that did have something in it. If a secretary not trained in deck landing can make a perfect deck landing first shot, <laughs> it looks good. It's a device which aids high-speed landings, particularly by jet fighters. The pilot watches a row of lights on the carrier as he comes into land. By lining them up with another blob of light reflected in a mirror, he can make a faultless touchdown. And it was simply a convex mirror with a light shining into it, reflecting up into the, the three and a half degrees into the glide slope. You could visualize a light of ray back behind the ship, and you were trying to fly down that ray. And the image was such that if you got above the glide slope, this little image in the center of it would go higher than the reference marks. And if you got below, obviously, it would go below the same indications. Today, the mirror has been replaced by Fresnel projector lamps. The center light, or meatball, moves above or below a row of green datum lights. Another carrier innovation was devised by Captain Dennis Campbell himself as a means of eliminating the need for a barrier. With carriers, we put up a safety barrier to keep the airplane from crashing into the planes that are already sitting on the deck forward. Well, the barrier is typically a wire, and the idea is that if you're landing with a propeller plane, the wire wraps around the propeller. Well, if there's no propeller, the wire comes right back into the cockpit and decapitates the pilot, which tends to be unpopular with pilots. Campbell angled the flight deck away from the deck park. With the angled deck, we could come aboard with a given power setting. If you missed a wire, add power and go on around. It came along at the time of the jets, which was great for them, in that you just left 80% power on, you pick up the wire, swell. You miss the wire, go around again. We um, introduced both the angle deck and the mirror at once. And it's not absolutely clear from the statistics, but certainly of at least uh, for every five accidents we used to have, we now only had one. 
In 1960, the Americans added nuclear power to the British.